Hi, I'm Atim Chinzira, and today I'm going to read a book for you called Seven Spools of Thread, a Kwanzaa Story. And before I read the story to you, I want to give you a little context of what Kwanzaa is. Kwanzaa was started in 1966 by an activist and scholar named Dr. Mulana Karenga. The colors of Kwanzaa are green, red, and black, just like the Pan-African flag. And the idea of Kwanzaa is in support of creating reverence and thoughtfulness around what community is and what Pan-Africanism is into some form or fashion of identity. Um, the context, pre-context of Kwanzaa is that Africans uh, during the enslavement period of the North America, South America, and the Europe's, the transatlantic enslavement trade, was that Africans were taken from their homeland and brought and scattered across the diaspora, meaning the rest of the world, uh, by way of ship, the only mode of transportation at the time. They were chained and they were brought around the world and they were assimilated into other cultures, um, whether it be Portuguese, uh, Spanish, French, English, Dutch. Uh, they were all trafficked across the entire world and used uh, to as free labor and treated inhumanely. Consequently, they lost a lot of Africanisms, meaning of their African languages, a lot of their African culture, a lot of their African traditions, um, and became native then to the places that they were brought to, like Brazil, Africans in Mexico, Africans um, in the North Americas, Africans in the islands of Jamaica or the Caribbean, Africans um, all around the world were brought from Africa. And so black is the color of black people from Africa. Uh, green is for the land of Africa. And red is for the blood that was shed. Blood that I think was shed uh, defending and in route uh, to the new lands that Africans were brought to. Uh, it's a spinoff of the Ethiopian flag, the red, green, and gold. And though gold is a part of the Pan-African flag as far as the symbol of rich riches of Africa, it isn't a part of that flag. It's the red, green, and the black, just like the candles that are used uh, in the Kinara, which I'll explain to you momentarily. There are seven principles in Kwanzaa that are celebrated. The first one being Umoja. Umoja means unity. To strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. The second principle of the seven is Kujishakalia, self-determination. To define ourselves, name ourselves, create ourselves, speak for ourselves, instead of being defined, named, created for, and spoken for by others. For example, my name is Atim Bomani Boykin. I was born Atim Bomani Boykin. My parents thought it was important to give all of their children, me included, African names. Because no matter how light our skin is, no matter where we are in the United States, we need, in their perspective, to understand where our roots lie. Because no matter who we think we are, we'll be treated black, and we need to understand, appreciate, and embrace our blackness. Therefore, they gave us Atim Bomani for me, and I chose my own last name, Chenzira. So self-determination, we choose our own names to identify ourselves because in root in enslavement, a lot of Africans were given the names of the people who trafficked them, who owned them, and did not have the ability to name themselves. If you've seen Roots, there's a scene 
of uh, young uh, Kuta Kente, who was beat into submission, broken, and given the name Toby. The third principle is Ujima. Ujima is collective work and responsibility. And in any community that thrives, there's a collective responsibility. They say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, this also is a part of, this is the third principle of the seven, is to build and maintain our community together and make our sisters and brothers' problems our problems, therefore having empathy to solve them together. And it's taking responsibility for the village. The fourth of the seven principles is Ujama. Ujama is cooperative economics. To build and maintain our stores, shops, and businesses and profit from them together. In a lot of instances, money circulates within a really strong community, economically strong community, five to seven, sometimes eight to 10 times. Well, in a very uh, weak economic community, it might only circulate once or twice before it leaves the community, meaning people in the community buy goods that are made from outside of the community Therefore, the money doesn't circulate inside the community. That says or implies that people aren't business owners or people aren't being responsible with their dollars in order to make sure that they are supporting their community members who also own businesses. You own a restaurant. I own an ice cream shop. My sister owns uh, uh, dry cleaners and my brother owns a barber shop, for example. So I get my clothes washed and then I go get my, my, my ice cream or my food and my hair done all in the same neighborhood. So at least it circulates four times if everybody's spending money together. Nia is the fourth, I'm sorry, the fifth of the seven principles. Nia means purpose. To take, I mean, to make or our collective vocation, the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness prior to the breakdown uh, or the colonialization um, and the infiltration of Africa, uh, you had um, human problems like everywhere else, but it worsens when you uh, take a people from their land uh, through terror and through human trafficking and bring them from their home place to other places around the world. Tragedy. So it's it's a principle of having purpose to uh, restore our people to their traditional greatness, stand and, and support each other in, 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 our, in our dreams and, in our, and support each other in our aspirations. Um, the fifth, sorry, the sixth of the seven principles is Kumba. Kumba is creativity. To always do as much as we can in the way we can in order to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than we inherited it. That means creativity is an important ingredient in resilience. So for example, you fall down, you stay down because you have no other way to be. Well, the idea of resilience is you get back up and you try something new. You lose something, you try something new. You don't have the resources, you figure it out, you make something happen. Art comes from that, music comes from that. Innovation, uh, it comes from that, meaning something new out of, uh, out, of, out of new elements or something old out of new elements, but you're being creative in problem solving and making a way where there were no way, where there was no way before. And the last one of the seven principles of Kwanzaa is Imani. I have a sister with a middle name, Imani. And that means faith. Because when you go through a lot of hard, difficult, uh, traumatic problems, challenges, uh, African people are very spiritual people. Um, so you have to have faith in a power greater than yourself um, to um, get through difficulty at times. And to believe with all our heart in our people, our parents, our leaders, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. So Kwanzaa was created to give 
Nia to community that had been traditionally trampled, stepped on, hurt, and abused. Um, and for people who have been for centuries um, removed from their traditions, from their tongues, from their culture. Uh, it is a holiday that is about mindfulness and meditation around each principle to remember and to remind ourselves of setting an intention about how we walk in our world and to develop culture from chaos, order from chaos, and to reach and teach and to instill in ourselves through our thoughtfulness and our actions, Kwanzaa. So now I read the seven spools of thread. In a small African village in the country of Ghana, there lived an old man and his seven sons. After the death of his wife, the old man became both father and mother to the boys. The seven brothers were handsome young men. Their skin was as smooth and dark as the finest mahogany wood. Their limbs were as straight and strong as warriors' spears. But they were a disappointment to their father. From morning until night, the family's small home was filled with the sound of brothers quarreling. As soon as the sun brought forth a new day and the brothers began to argue, they argued all morning about how to tend the crops. They argued all afternoon about the weather. It's hot, said the middle son. No, a cool breeze is blowing said the second son. They argued all evening about when to return home. It will be dark soon, the youngest said. Let's finish this row and begin anew tomorrow. No, it's too early to stop, called the third son. Can't you see the sun is setting? shouted the sixth son. By the way, this book was illustrated by Daniel Minter, one of the co-founders of Indigo Arts. And so it would continue until the moon beamed down and the stars twinkled in the sky. A mealtime, the young men argued, until stew was cold and the fufu was hard. You gave him more than you gave me, whined the third son. I divided the food equally, said the father. I will starve with only this small portion on my plate, complained the youngest. If you don't want it, I'll eat it, said the oldest son. He grabbed a handful of meat from his brother's plate. Stop being so greedy, said the youngest. And so it went on. Every night, it was often morning before the seven brothers finished their dinner. One sad day, the old man died and was buried. At sunrise the morning, the next morning, the village chief called the brothers before him. Your father has left an inheritance, said the chief. The brothers whispered excitedly amongst themselves. I know my father left me everything because I'm the oldest son. I know my father left me everything because I'm the youngest son said the youngest son. He left everything to me, said the middle son. I know I was his favorite. Eee, said the second son. Everything is mine. The brothers began shouting and shoving. Soon all the seven were rolling around on the ground, hitting and kicking each other. Stop that this instant, said the chief. The brothers stopped fighting. They shook the dust off their clothes and sat before the chief, eyeing each other suspiciously. A 
Your father has decreed that all of his property and possessions will be divided among you equally, said the chief. But first, by the time the moon rises tonight, you must learn how to make gold out of these spools of thread. If you do not, you will be turned out of your home as beggars. The oldest brother received the blue thread. Next, brother, red. The next, yellow. The middle son was given orange thread. The next, green. The next, black. And the youngest son received white thread. For once, the brothers were speechless. Beautiful art. The chief spoke again. From this moment forward, you must not argue amongst yourselves or raise your hands in anger towards one another. If you do, your father's property and all his possessions will divide it, be divided equally among the poorest of the villagers. Go quickly, you have only a little time. The brothers bowed to the chief and hurried away. When the seven Ashanti brothers arrived at their farm, something unusual happened. They sat side by side from the oldest to the youngest without saying anything unkind to each other. My brothers, the oldest said after a while, let us shake hands and make peace amongst ourselves. Let us never argue or fight again, said the youngest brother. The brothers placed their hands together and held each other tightly. For the first time in years, peace rested within the walls of their home. My brothers, the third son said quietly, surely our father would not turn us into the world as beggars. I agree, said the middle son. I do not believe our father would have given us a task of turning thread into gold if it were impossible. Could it be, said the oldest son, that there might be small pieces of gold in this thread? The sun beamed hotly overhead. Yellow streams of light crept inside the hut. Each brother held up his spool of thread. The beautiful color sparkled in the sunlight, but there were no nuggets of gold in these spools. I'm afraid not, my brother, said the sixth son, but that was a good idea. Thank you, my brother, said the oldest. See that support? You'll see that the seven principles of Kwanzaa are hidden in this story. Could it be, said the youngest, that by making something from this thread, we could earn a fortune in gold? Perhaps, said the oldest. We could make cloth out of this thread and sell it. I believe we can do it. Uh, this is a good plan, said the middle son, but we do not have enough of any one color to make a full bolt of cloth. What if, said the third son, we weave the thread together to make a cloth of many colors. But our people do not wear cloth like that, said the fifth son. We wear only cloth of one color. Maybe, said the second son, we could make a cloth that is so special, everyone will want to wear it. Creativity. My brothers, said the sixth son, we could finish faster if we all work together. I know we can succeed, said the middle son. The seven Ashanti brothers went to work. Together they cut the wood to make a loom. The younger brothers held the pieces together while the older brother assembled the loom. You see that picture? They all have a purpose. Now look at that cloth. Does that look familiar? Have you ever seen cloth like that? 
I graduated school with a cloth like that. They took turns weaving cloth out of their spools of thread. They made a pattern of stripes and shapes that looked like wings of a bird. They used all of the colors, blue, red, yellow, orange, green, black, and white. Soon the brothers had several pieces of beautiful multicolored cloth. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? When the cloth was finished, the seven brothers took turns neatly folding the brightly colored fabric. Then they placed it in the seven baskets and put their baskets on their heads. The brothers formed a line from the oldest to the youngest and began the journey to the village. The sun slowly made a golden path across the sky. The brothers hurried down the long, dusty road as quickly as they could. This is beautiful. From oldest to the youngest. Got the sun in there. As soon as they entered the marketplace, the seven Ashanti brothers called out, Come and buy the most wonderful cloth in the world. Come and buy the most wonderful cloth in the world. Come and buy the most wonderful cloth in the world. They unfolded a bolt and held it up for all to see. The multicolored fabric glistened like a rainbow. A crowd gathered around the seven Ashanti brothers. Oh, said one villager, I have never seen cloth so beautiful. Look at that unusual pattern. Ah, said another, this is the finest fabric in all the land. Feel the texture. Amazing, look at that cloth and all those people gathered. The brothers smiled proudly. Suddenly a man dressed in magnificent robes pushed his way to the front of the crowd. Everyone stepped back respectfully. It was the king's treasurer. He rubbed the cloth between the palms of his hands, then he held it up. To the sunlight. Hmm. What a thing of beauty, he said, fingering the material. This cloth will make a wonderful gift for the king. I must have it all. The seven brothers whispered together. Cloth fit for kings, said the oldest, should be purchased at a price only a king can pay. It is yours for one bag of gold. Sold, said the king's treasurer. He untied his bag of gold and spilled out the many pieces for the brothers. The seven Ashanti brothers ran out of the marketplace and back down the road to their village. A shining silver moon began to creep up in the sky. Panting and dripping with sweat, the brothers threw themselves before the chief's hut. Oh, chief, said the oldest, we have turned that thread into gold. The chief came out of his hut and sat upon a stool. The oldest brother poured the gold out into the ground. Have you argued or fought today? Asked the chief. No, my chief, said the youngest. We have been too busy working together to argue or fight. Hmm, then you have learned the lesson your father sought to teach you, said the chief. All that he had is now yours. The older brother smiled happily, but the youngest son looked sad. Well, what about the poor people in the village, he asked. We received an inheritance, but what will they do? See that noble man right there? That younger brother was really concerned about the community, right? Perhaps, said the oldest, we could teach them how to turn the thread into gold. Now that's collective responsibility, would you say? And collective economics. The chief smiled. 
You have learned your lesson very well. The seven Ashanti brothers taught their people carefully. The village became famous for its beautiful multicolored cloth and the villagers prospered. You see those seven brothers, the seven principles of Kwanzaa, working together, having a purpose, united, all the principles of Kwanzaa in this book in action. It's amazing. From that day until this, the seven Ashanti brothers have worked together farming the land. And they have worked peacefully in honor of their father. Now, just to tell you, because I didn't say it in the beginning, this book was written by Angela Shelf Madeiras. I hope I didn't butcher your name. And illustrated by Maine's own Daniel Minter. If you want to know a little bit more about Kwanzaa, if you're curious about the seven principles, beyond what I said today, please check out an article in Oprah Magazine, the O Magazine. They published an article on December 8th, 2020. These Kwanzaa traditions celebrate the power of honoring our past. And it speaks in a little more in depth and probably a little more concise than I did about the tradition of Kwanzaa. Now, to give you a little context, there is a tradition to have an ear of corn for every child in the house. And when I was in college, I went to Cal State Northridge in Southern California, where there was a Pan-African Studies department. And one of my majors is Pan-African Studies. They call it Africana Studies now, but I have a bachelor's degree in Pan-African Studies. So I got to study Africans from around the world with scholars um, from around the nation and around the world, actually. I had uh, uh, African professors uh, who are teaching in the, in the university as well. Well, I learned Kwanzaa from Dr. Fulton, who was one of the young men on the Montgomery bus rides. Uh, and each year, whoever touched the corn, because corn symbolizes fertility, would be a new parent the next year. So, word of the wise, if you're not looking, don't touch the corn. Uh, just a fun fact and a little context to how I've learned a little bit about Kwanzaa. Uh, and to be transparent, I haven't practiced Kwanzaa in quite a few years. Uh, but now that I'm a new father, I plan on reintroducing that tradition this year. Uh, my wife is Jewish and she practices Hanukkah. So we do have a menorah, uh, but a kenara is the candle holder for uh, the seven candles of Kwanzaa. And so in uh, the kenara, you have uh, three green and three red uh, candles and one seven. Well, the seventh candle is one black, just like the Pan-African flag green, black, and red. I hope you had fun uh, hearing the story of Kwanzaa in action, being given some context about what Kwanzaa uh, means, and given some uh, context to why Kwanzaa was important. So again, I'm my team, Chen Zira. Started 1966 by Dr. Muolana Karenga uh, and I hope you talk a little bit about what you've heard today with your family and friends of what Kwanzaa means. Thank you and happy Kwanzaa.